Previously, we did a titration of a strong acid and strong base. Now we'll look at other types of titration. There are, in general, four types of titration because there are two kinds of acids and two kinds of bases, strong and weak. Let us look at the titration of a strong acid on a weak alkaline. The acid is our titrant in the burette, and while you can calculate the values yourself, this is how the titration curve looks like. The initial pH is high, as it is an alkali, and as we add more acid, the pH reduces. Notice that the pH change is really gradual at the start. And why? Here we are reacting a strong acid with a weak base, for example, HCl with ammonia, to form ammonium chloride. And as we have talked about in the earlier checkpoint in the previous lesson, on salt hydrolysis, certain salts can dissolve in water to give acidic and basic solutions. Ammonium can react with water to form hydronium ions, and this makes the solution more acidic. This has two implications. It sets up a buffer in the region before the equivalence point, and two, it reduces the pH of the equivalence point to something that is lower than 7 because the solution at the equivalence is acidic due to salt hydrolysis. The indicator to use for this is likely to be methyl orange, because the end point of the indicator is somewhere in the change region of the equivalence point. Contrast the titration curve when you put a strong base inside the conical flask instead of putting a weak base. The pH starts out higher because it's a strong base, there is no buffer form, and the equivalence point is somewhere much closer to 7. And you can relate this to salt hydrolysis concepts. Next, let's look at a strong base on a weak acid. The weak acid is now in the conical flask. At the start, pH is low because it is an acid. It is very similar to the other case. As we add more base, the pH gradually increases until it reaches the equivalence point. The graph on the left of the, to the left of the equivalence point has such a shape because it is actually a buffer. Again, the salt formed between a strong base and a weak acid forms a conjugate base salt that will want to reform the weak acid by reacting with water. And hence, further increasing the pH of the solution, this makes the pH at equivalence point not exactly 7, but something larger than 7 due to salt hydrolysis, producing hydroxide ions. If you swap the weak acid with a strong acid instead, the graph will look like this one. Again, there is no buffer, the pH starts out much lower, and the equivalence point pH is much closer to 7. Notice for both graphs that there is a point of inflection in the buffering region, and guess what? This point is actually pH equals to pKa, and it is an inflection point, which you do not really need to know why, because it's mostly mathematics. Now, the last type of titration that we, where we have is that of a weak acid and weak alkali, and this is a titration curve. As you can probably see, the curve looks disgusting, and you can barely tell where the equivalence point is if I didn't tell you. Because both the acid and base are weak, the degree of salt hydrolysis tends to be small, hence the pH is roughly 7. Although if you recall the salt hydrolysis checkpoint, it really depends on the Ka and Kb of the acid and base respectively, for the stronger one will have a dominant effect over the other. Because both are weak, it doesn't form any decent buffer, so there is no maximum buffering capacity observed. Note that for such a titration, because there is no sharp equivalence point, it is very hard to use an indicator because you do not know when exactly it has reached equivalence because the change region is now much larger than the narrow one that we are used to. So from all these titration curves, ultimately what is important is not just being able to calculate the pH at certain amounts of titrant, but also being able to explain why the graph is shaped in a certain way, why is the equivalence point not at 7, for example, why is there a buffer form, etc. And always relate everything you know back to the strength of acids and bases following which you can always talk about the K-dissociation constant to prove your point.